Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Today I'm going to be sharing an interview that I just did with Anya from Our Gabled Home. She is a blogger and a YouTuber. She has a lot of knowledge in fermented foods, so we talk about that. We talk about what we're cooking in the spring, all kinds of fun stuff, so join us now. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. So I'm here with Anya. She is from the, she has a blog and a YouTube channel called Our Gabled Home. And she shares fermenting recipes from scratch, lots of DIY, lots of just gardening, homespun type of things. So tell us a little bit about your blog and the best way to find you. Well, um, my blog is exactly what you just said. It's a lot of things that I do at home and have been doing for a long time. And that's where the inspiration came from to share this with other people. And somewhere along the way, I think I found you. And then I thought, oh, this is so cool. I could probably share it with more people than just my family. So you can find me on my blog at ourgabledhome.com. You can find me on YouTube. Um, the channel has the same name, OurGableHome.com. I'm over on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, not super active. And I'm on Pinterest. And they're all the same handles, Our Gable yeah, Home. That makes so it easy. really easy. Yes, yeah. yes, super easy. You were telling me that a lot of what you do on your blog and in your real life, like you were just telling me that you upholster these chairs pre-blog. So you've obviously been into this long before that you, um, it, it came from your upbringing. Right. Right. I grew up in Germany and we would spend time at our grandparents and it didn't really occur to me back then, but in hindsight, they were homesteaders in the true sense. Um, they had a huge garden and they were so cute. My grandmother would be in the kitchen. My grandfather would go out in the garden and he would tend to all his, I mean, they grew most of the vegetables and fruits that they ate. They had cherry trees and apple trees and plum trees and raspberries and blackberries and red currants and black currants. And so wow. we would sometimes go there in the summer. I know it was idyllic for kids because you could just run around in the garden and he would put us around in the wheelbarrows and it was, and then he would bring the food in for lunch and my grandmother would cook it. And then in the fall, she would jam and um, preserve and can and do all these things. And then they would drive out and get half a cow and stick it in their freezer. And then they would take another little, um, outing and get their grains because they were baking the kind of sourdough bread that I still make these days. Yeah. And then they sometimes would send me down in their little village to the dairy and get two quarts of milk that was so warm. It was just freshly milked. It was so warm. It still had the temperature of the cow. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had raw milk when, and yeah. they were organic before that was even a word. And later I thought it was so neat. I inherited a lot of their things. Once I passed, I have so many kitchen items from them and furniture that my cousins joke, hey, if you want to go to a grandparents' house, you just need to go to Anya's place. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really the inspiration, I guess. And then, yeah, I just took it from there. I was always into baking. I was interested in whole wheat baking when I was 14. I would bake cakes and cookies and all whole wheat because um, I wanted to be healthy. And yeah, yeah, just one thing from led to another from there. Right. Yeah. So do you feel like your grandparents, were they motivated by health or was it just the culture of the time? I think it was just how it was because they had that garden yeah. and um, they were, like so thrifty. they were born, yeah, thrifty, you know, after the second world war, there wasn't a whole lot. When my dad was a kid, they had to herd the cows. So um, I think it was just a continuation. They got rid of the animals at some point. They had chickens and and they must have had goats because there was in the basement, there was a little stable, I guess, within the house for the goats. Yeah. Um, but they had no animals when, um, when I was there. And um, so they just continued on with the, and my grandfather was a forester. So um, he was super knowledgeable about plants and gardening and all that thing. So. Right. So you had a background in knowing how to do a lot of this stuff. And then you were motivated to get into it yourself just by probably like me like yeah. health, you know, was one of the first catalysts for it. And fun. And you know what? Yeah. I mean, on some of these things that I make myself, I can 
purchase at the store for half the money. Cheaper, yeah. But that's not, that's not what this is about. I yeah. mean, the pride and the sense of accomplishment and like, hey, I can do things. Yes. And the fun, uh, you know, along the way when you're making it, you, there's no price tag on it. Yeah. And I always say, what else are you going to do? You know, like this is yeah. how we we're meant as humans to do things with our hands to sustain our lives. And so things have gotten so convenient. Now it's like, well, now what do we do with all of our time? And so we just fill it in ways that right. aren't exactly fulfilling. Right. You know? And this is so meaningful and you're actually creating something and, you know, it is healthy and is it always cheaper? But again, you know, in some things you can't put a price tag because the, you know, the, the sense of achievement and pride you get for yourself. I mean, that, that, you know, how do you put a price tag on that? Like I said. Yeah. And it does taste better. It does. You it know, does. like for example, some of the fermented foods, a little bit of sauerkraut or something with your meal, that's a special taste that till I started fermenting myself, I didn't have. That just wasn't something like a part of the meal that you had that sour, crisp, but you know, it's just like a depth that yeah. you don't get with anything else. So yeah, and I believe in, um, is it the Japanese or the Chinese? They have the, the five tastes. Yeah, and right, right. They, were they talk about how in the West we have salty and we have sweet. Yep. And I think we have sour, but we don't have astringent. And uh, we don't have some of the other tastes and bitter. So uh -huh, bitter, um, yeah. that's, yeah, that's why I think, yeah, you know what? We, we really don't. And there is something about bitter for... Um, what is it? Gall bile protection or something. Yeah, and, um, you can take all the bitters. Yeah. But I like arugula and, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the others like chicory? And, um, there are some, there are some bitter tastes in the West that you can easily get. It's, uh, but sometimes it's an acquired taste. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Whenever I've had people taste kefir for the first time, they're like, what is this? I'm like, oh, really? Oh, get really oh. used to it. <laughs> I mean, I ferment mine really strong. I'll leave it out on the counter for two or three days just because we're used to it. I like it. I don't really Super bubbly. <laughs> yeah. I don't strain it off until we need it. So if there's like a gallon of it in the fridge, I just leave it on the counter. And yeah. so yeah, it's quite yeah. fermented. Yeah. So we are going to talk a little bit about spring cooking, which the arugula and all of that leads us right into it. What kind of things are you making right now that maybe you don't get to make? I don't know what part of the country you're in. I'm in California, Northern California. Okay. So yeah. I'm not and sure. And we're lucky in that pretty much everything grows here all year round. Oh, well then. Okay. So maybe your <laughs> seasonal cooking is a little bit different. <laughs> from mine. Yeah, it is. It is somewhat seasonal, but um, then, then not so much because we don't really have that winter season when everything is covered with snow and, and basically not dead, but you know, hibernating. That, that's great though. Great that you don't have it is what I meant to say. <laughs> no, I mean, but then, you know, we don't have snow for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. So. We never, so, we never have snow for Christmas. We have snow in January, but not Christmas. I mean, there's been like, I can think of two Christmases probably in the last, since I've been paying attention. So maybe 15 years that there's been snow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, we always wish. So, um, I also really believe in eating seasonally, even though, you know, depending on where you are, you may not have very pronounced seasons, or I think that we have three seasons here in Northern California because it really supports the body the best um, because you're getting the kind of nutrients that your body needs. And so in the spring, I really like to cook with a lot of fresh herbs and greens and um, that sort of detoxing from a heavier yeah. winter meal. Um, so I never meal plan. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> the only, the only moment I would meal plan is when I have some things that need to be eaten that yeah. I have to think about what do I want to do with it, but I don't sit down with a pen and a paper. Um, I, I'm such a, um, just flying by the seat of her pants type yeah. of gal. <laughs> yep, same. I sometimes just look in the fridge. It's like, okay, what's there? And, um, I think I want to do a video about how to cook without recipes and how to just cook with what you have and how yeah. you can have a few staples. And from there, I've been just throwing things together. And then sometimes yeah. when we do a meatless meal, it's like, oh, I'll just open a can of chickpeas. I mean, yes, I do buy cans and I don't you know, make okay. everything it's from still scratch. A whole food. <laughs> it is a whole food and it's, it's a healthy protein, vegetarian protein source. And, and you need things on hand like that so that there are going to be times where you have to throw a meal together, no matter how yeah. even planned people are, there just are going to be times where you were out all day and you can't 
make right. chickpeas from scratch, you know, it's, it's five o'clock and you know, what do you do? You open a can of chickpeas and throw that in there. And, um, that's a, that's a good meal. So yeah, that's kind of like what I, I do. I, I try to buy things in season. My husband called me the other day and says, I'm at the store. What do you want? And I said, I think I have everything. He goes, do you want strawberries? I'm like, no, I don't think that's really a, um, a an April food. So <laughs> we passed on the strawberries. Yeah, you can get them, but not necessarily <laughs> and I don't April find them. Food. Well, and we could have had that conversation. Where did they come from? Did they come from Mexico or, you know, some other place? And do we want to support that? And also, I don't find them as tasty as when, I, I mean, weirdly enough, I have strawberries growing in my garden right now wow. and I haven't done anything. They just never died. And I checked there the other day and I have full blossoms and I have little, I don't think they're going to be good because we don't get enough sun and it's still sometimes um, freezing in the morning here, believe it yeah. or not. Yeah. So I don't think they're going to be good, but they're there. Yeah, they're still there. They're making it through. Yeah. So what are, people do struggle with that, with um, making things on the fly without a meal plan. And I do think partially it just comes from experience. Like once you know how to cook right. each thing, it's really not as tricky. Like when I first was married, I had to learn how to cook everything. And so I kind of needed a plan and a recipe. But right. like you, I like to open the fridge and be like, well, there's some meat, there's some veggies, we can cook that up. You know, maybe, maybe there's some arugula in the garden or something seasonal or herbs or that you could throw in. Do you have any tips yeah. for that offhand? I mean, one thing I always tell people is salt. I feel like people don't salt. season their food enough. <laughs> That's my personal belief. Yeah. Yeah. Or just herbs. Herbs. I yeah. Mean, exactly. I have this herb, salt, garlic. Yeah. 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 And spices. Um, I, you know, my, my, I think my biggest tip, and um, I feel a little bit like I'm giving something away, but I'm going to give it away, <laughs> is <laughs> I always have the soft goat cheese in the fridge. Okay. And that goes pretty much with everything. If you have a bunch of veggies and you just cut them up and roast them, or you, you fry them in your cast iron skillet, and then you toss some of the soft goat cheese on top, or if you roast it in the oven, you let it melt on top and let it get brown. That is a salty taste, but it also has the, um, I guess it's the umami, the cheesy flavor. And um, I mean, we love it. We all love it so much. I'm, I'm not sure if people who are a little bit skittish about the goat taste, um, I don't think it tastes so much like goat, but um, that is almost like, you know, Big Lebowski, the rug that ties the room together. <laughs> uh huh. That's your, <laughs> that's your little move that, with you. <laughs> yeah, it just always i mean it always brings out all the flavors and then you can just throw some herbs on top i have parsley totally exploding in my garden mm -hmm. i um i have some um some italian kale that is still just growing and growing and growing almost like weeds and i can always go in there and chop off some some leaves and throw them on there right and yeah so um goat cheese is one of my i guess it's my number one just Tip. always have it in the fridge. Huh. Parmesan is always great. Okay. It's again that cheesy flavor, a little saltiness, a little uh -huh. nutty, a little sweet. Actually, uh, you know, if you have a bouillon, you can always do things with that. I'd have to think what other things, but I have a few staples in my fridge, and I was going to do a video about if you have yeah, these, so like, you'll have a video, three or four or five things. Yeah. Yeah. You, and you, no matter what you have in the fridge, you can always throw a meal together and put it on yeah. the table. I always rely on if nothing else there's eggs. There's always eggs in the yeah. fridge. So eggs we can have eggs and yeah. veggies, or you can even put eggs on top of a potato-y type, like a hash type of situation. That's always yeah. good too. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was yeah. going to ask you, I was looking through your blog <laughs> and there were a few things in there that I have never heard of. <laughs> I was <laughs> intrigued by. So one is German pork. I'm interested in this because it was made with milk and we're, we're going to have a dairy cow in September calf and we currently milk goats. Oh, exciting. Yeah. So I'll have a lot of milk more than I'll know what to do with. So what is this? Yeah. What do you use it for? So yeah, it's funny because um, first of all, there's the word, how do you, how do you say that? Right? Quark. Uh -huh. <laughs> and is then that people right? say, isn't that, yeah, isn't that something from physics? Like what, what's an outer yeah. space or something like that? And like, yeah, yeah, that's, a, that, that, that's there too. But um, no, it is actually um, in European cultures, it's a fairly common um, dairy product. Okay. It is so common that in Germany, for example, you can get 
let me just do, quickly do the math. It, I think it would be like two pints for like 99 cents. It is super cheap okay. and it might even be organic. So it is a soft, very fresh, very young cheese, if you will. It's okay. a little bit like ricotta okay. um, yeah. or um, cottage cheese, but it doesn't have the little um, curdled Right, um, more like things the in consistency it. of ricotta. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little softer than that. And it's um, slightly, okay, I'm going to have an ESL moment. That's English as a second language. Is oh, okay. Tangy, 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 tangy. Yeah, slightly tangy taste. Um, and you can use it instead of sour cream on potatoes. Mm. Uh, you can make super yummy German style cream cheese with it, which is super light. It's not as heavy as the cream cheese based. Um, okay, so it spreads easier. Yeah. Um, cheesecake and um, it also has a bit of a tangier, fresher taste, um, and it's 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 fantastic. And you can use it instead of yogurt or, uh, you know, I mean, there's so many things you can you can make you can bake with it. There's a type of dough that has oil and cork. Okay. Um, and you can do that instead of like a like a like a crust for a, a cake or something. Okay. And, um, okay. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have to. Yeah look a little bit more into it. And um, there's another idea for a video. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Cause I've never heard of it and I am really interested in learning. Like I haven't made any cheeses yet. I've been getting milk from a local farm forever. And I've just, I've never yeah. had enough to need to do that. Like I always make kefir and yogurt, but I've never had this abundance of milk, but I'm going to. And so I'm like, I need to find more. You're going to yeah, you're going to need a lot of uh, milk for that quark. And okay. the way I make quark is from buttermilk. So first I make the buttermilk and okay. then I make the quark. And once you do, you'll be surprised how little quark comes out and how much whey you actually get. But right. you don't need yeah. to throw the whey out. You can do something with the whey. You can put the whey in your sourdough. And that actually is always like putting your sourdough on steroids. You can drink the whey. You can feed it back to your animals. Um, okay, I've never really put high it protein. in the sourdough. That is something I've never tried. Yeah, I guess, my mom just give it some sent me a probiotics. Yeah, my mom just sent me a little snippet yesterday, a little picture, and um, because when I talk about my sourdough, I always tell people use filtered water or use distilled water because if your water is chlorinated, yeah, that really um, um, hinders your sourdough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she, in a German magazine or something, had said, "Oh, you can use whey for your sourdough instead of using chlorinated tap water." Oh. Well, so I would probably try that. I probably would like still hold back my like master starter and then just feed right. a large amount for like pancakes tomorrow with the whey. Mm -hmm. So that's a good idea. Cause I've, I've definitely made things like I've strained off yogurt and had whey and yeah, not really known exactly what to do with it, but that is a really good idea. Yeah. And then I think there's uh, recipes like, uh, Kvass, which is more of a yes, Russian. I've seen that, but I've never tried it. Yeah. And I think you can use not a whole lot, just a little bit of whey to get some good cultures in there and get it, get the fermentation going. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, well, so that's something cheese I I'll be watching you and your cheese making because I want to get into cheese making too. But first of all, you need a lot of milk. Mm -hmm, and I exactly. made some cheese, which was which was which was good, but I overdid a little bit on the salt because I was worried that we didn't put enough salt on uh -huh. it, and um, it was good, but definitely room for improvement. <laughs> was it like a mozzarella you made? <clears throat> um, it it seemed at the time to be the easiest. Okay. I got this book, The Art of Cheese Making. Yeah, I, I think this... people start with like a soft cheese, like a ricotta type, and then a mozzarella, mm -hmm. from what I understand. Yeah, and this was more of a um. Um, I let it age a little bit, but then I realized I don't really have the conditions to, I don't have a cave and, yeah. and I don't know if I want to get, you could theoretically take a wine fridge and set the humidity and the temperature to oh. how cheese likes it best. Okay. But that was a little bit more than what I wanted to do at the get time. Into, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how far I go with it. I definitely want to start learning at least a little bit because if we're going to be milking a cow, I'm like, I don't really want to be buying any dairy products at all from the store. So oh, I think I'm, you'll have so much milk. You don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Another one was uh, beef <clears throat> pasta. So that yeah. looked interesting and good and especially seasonal in a, a couple months here. Yeah. Um, 
So what do you want to know about it? How I made it? How I Yeah, yeah, how you make it, what you use yeah. it for. <laughs> yeah, so I basically just steam some beets. And what I have found is um, one time I tried to do a shortcut and buy some already steamed beets. Trader Joe's has some good ones. But the color just comes out almost more brown than red. It doesn't look vibrant at all. So right. I, I recommend using fresh beets. And then I blend them up with the eggs. So the um, beets, they're actually, even when they're steamed and when they're soft, they're not exactly mushy. So they're still chewy. And then if you blend them, you can get them a pretty soft consistency. So you don't have these big chunks of beet in your pasta. And then you just mix it with your pasta dough. I have that recipe on my blog and I have a video about it. I'd have to revisit and see yeah, exactly how no, I did I, it. They can go find it on your, on your blog. Yeah, but it's pretty simple. And then you just throw it together with, um, with your flour and your salt and your eggs. And if you have a pasta machine, um, we have a manual one that I love that attached to my kitchen counter. And then you just roll it out and it just looks so striking. Yes, um, it does. It looks so pretty. And it's a good way to add in beets. Like I know my kids would eat it. They would love the beets in that way. It tastes slightly sweet, but I know that some kids don't really care for the taste of beets and in this pasta i mean what kid doesn't love pasta right? yeah exactly <laughs> so no, it, it's a really no problem with it being in pasta it's a really easy way to sneak it in and yeah. <laughs> and it looks really fun and then back to my goat cheese if you pop the goat cheese down there oh. that makes the red pop even more because you have the contrast between the super white of the goat cheese it's a very clean white and against the red pasta and then you sprinkle some parsley on top and some Parmesan and you have a meal. It's oh, oh, yeah. so delicious. That makes me want to make so it tonight. Good. Seriously. <laughs> I want to make this whole thing. That sounds amazing. Well, if you make it, just know that I always like to wear gloves because when you peel yeah. the beets and when you work the pasta, oh, you just yeah. end up with really red hands. It disappears. Oh, yeah. It's all natural, but, but it'll be there for, for some day. reason you're not into it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beets definitely have that, especially fresh ones. I noticed that yeah. you also do a little bit of foraging, I guess, because I saw you had a stinging nettle spatzel. That's probably not the right way to say that. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's good enough. It's good enough. Yeah, <laughs> good enough. It's good enough. Right? <laughs> dandelion pesto, which I haven't done anything with dandelions in a while, but I know when I first found out they were edible, I was very intrigued. I was going all over our yard. We pretty much have, you know, we don't take care of our yard. So it's dandelion yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's no chemicals on it. So there's dandelions. Exactly. So my grandfather always said, there's no such thing as weeds. <laughs> uh -huh. um, because he considered every plant to be beneficial in some way or another. And dandelions is right up there. I, if people say, oh, I have so much, so many dandelions in my garden. I'm like, just give them to me. I'll take them from the roots you can dry them and roast them and make tea or a coffee substitute with it right um, yeah. the petals you they have almost like a little a bit of a honey taste um mm -hmm. you can chop them up and add them to your butter it gives your butter a really nice color and then the leaves they're bitter so they're that bitter taste you can add them just a little bit on your salad um, but you can make a pesto with it and if you're not really into the bitter and you don't want to go full on out on dandelion pesto you can add the dandelion leaves to any other pesto um, i mean pesto really is any any green herb right um, and then some nuts and olive oil and salt and maybe parmesan cheese and the pine nuts so um, you could add it to your basil pesto or parsley pesto you can make a spring herb pesto and just put in there whatever you want, including yeah. your stinging nettles. Stinging nettles make perfect pesto too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's not something I have collected is the nettles. I've looked into it, but I haven't actually foraged those. Oh, they're so good. They're so healthy. Yeah. And if you can manage to harvest them without getting stung, because that is not <laughs> pleasant. <laughs> yeah. You'll be rubbing your skin like, ah, hurts and things so um yeah just wear gloves be really careful and uh, once you steam them or cook them and prepare them they won't sting anymore and i have dried nettles and i have taken dried nettles and put them in my blender and made them into powder and you can just sprinkle it on food okay or i used to buy nettle in bulk from bulk herb store and make a tea i think it mm -hmm. is it iron that nettle is good for maybe it wasn't that yeah i, I think, think silica 
It's okay. Super healthy. Yeah. Do you have any other tips on that? Like, have you ever foraged uh, mushrooms or anything in your area? Yeah, we have. We went on a mushroom hike, but, um, you know, I think it takes a bit of research yeah, and it a lot of experience uh -huh. to know what you're doing. And unless you're a hundred percent certain that that is an edible one, I wouldn't eat it. Um, my husband and I were trying to get into it a little bit. At some point he was actually trying to grow them in our yard. He had these logs and he drilled holes in them and he put the, I forgot what's called the sodium yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The mycelium. He had oh, these little yeah. plugs that he put in them. But then we, I guess we didn't water them enough because it gets pretty dry here in the summer. And we got maybe five mushrooms. Out yeah. of <clears throat> we tried it too. And same, same thing. <laughs> we've gotten pretty familiar with the mushrooms in our area. We've gone on a couple of forays with the Mycological Society. So we, we have a handful of different kinds that we know for sure what we're doing. Yeah. We've eaten those. Yeah. But yeah, you definitely do want to be careful with that. And it's different, in different areas. So you can't go read it's... a book from another country because no. what looks no. like it there is poisonous here you know we would love to get more into mushrooms because we love to eat mushrooms and i think mushrooms are really cool um and just the idea of going out and hunting but um yeah we we haven't really done enough research and we don't have enough experience to feel confident yeah. enough about it understandable so, that's definitely something yeah. to be cautious about so another thing that got me into this whole blogging lifestyle and i joke about it because um i call it waldorf for adults so if you're not familiar with it, Waldorf education is, it's, it's, it's a little bit like Montessori. They have their own philosophy and curriculum. It's a private school. Um, they have tons and tons of them all over across North America. And I got into it because at the time when my kids were little, I wasn't looking for a school where they were doing math when they were three years old. I was looking for a school where they were playing. Yeah. And as soon as I came into the classrooms, they were warm. And they were cozy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is exactly what I want. So we stuck with the Waldorf education. And if you haven't heard about it, it's it's a really neat curriculum. But when I thought about this podcast, I thought, you know, um, Waldorf education is basically homeschooling in a school setting. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. they they make soups together, they bake uh -huh. bread together, and it's really cute because the kindergartners bake the bread and then they go around to the other grades and offer the other grades bread so that the young ones actually get to do something for the older kids. And um, it's a really neat curriculum. In third grade, it's all about being self-sustainable. So um, that's where they make butter and they, again, they make bread and they look into shelters like home building and it's more than just math and reading and mm -hmm. writing and science. And they usually combine it. So let's say they study bees, then they use math skills for studying bees, but um, they also look into biology and um, they draw really neat pictures. And it's just, um, if I had to do it all over again, I would, I would still um, do it because I think it's a really neat curriculum. So I have a lot of um, adult friends that, you know, parents from our Waldorf years, and I joke to them and say, yeah, I never got out of the Waldorf thing. So I'm just doing Waldorf for adults. Uh -huh. <laughs> Waldorf for adults on your blog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think anytime you get a little bit into one thing, it leads to another and you find that you're yeah. interested, you know, people who aren't, I'm thinking you just need to take the first step because I really think most people would find it interesting to put your hand to something like that and get better and, you know, learn just one yeah, and once, another. yeah, and once you, um, you start making things, you're like, oh, huh, that, that wasn't so difficult. And then yes. you become more confident trying other things. And, you know, back to the Waldorf experience, I, uh, you know, in hindsight, I still have to laugh uh, when I signed my kids up for the preschool. They hadn't even started and we got this huge handout as parents like, okay, so you need to sew your children aprons and placemats and napkins and they don't put names on them because, you know, obviously they don't read when they're three and yeah. four or five years old, but you, you pick a certain fabric, a certain calico, and it had to be a theme. So the apron and the placemats and the napkins and the, and I think they had to have like a bag for their, like, I don't know, like, like their exercise shoes or something. They all have to be in the same print. So the kids knew exactly, oh, that's so-and-so's bag, just right, by the print. Just by the print, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we hadn't even started and I was already sewing at night. <laughs> aprons, yeah. little aprons for little kids. <laughs> 
That is fun. I've thought that about uh, which kind of school. I hadn't really heard of Waldorf, but I heard of Montessori. I'm like, that literally sounds like homeschool that you go to school. Like, it seems like yeah. what homeschoolers do, but in a school setting. Right. Said. Yeah. I've definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That. And my son's knitted socks. Yeah. <laughs> all this, all the girls knit. I mean, all the boys knit uh-huh. and um, they do woodworking and um, they do a lot of crafts. And so they become very confident. And my kids um, at the time, they, it's also sometimes people joke about and say, it's called wild dorks. Wild dorks. Um, and wild dorks they don't dorks use to. <laughs> <laughs> By modern standards, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Waldorf's and yeah. they don't use textbooks they make their own and there was a time when <clears throat> the kids are like I want to just open a textbook and there's something there and I don't have to make my own yeah, but in hindsight <laughs> right <laughs> um, but in hindsight both of them said that they absolutely loved their years at the Waldorf school um, preschool yeah. kindergarten and they went through eighth grade so you're just still wa- doing the Waldorf thing <laughs> I never grew out of it <laughs> never grew out of Waldorf I don't plan to ever I think that whenever my kids all grow up and I have a little extra time I hope to make quilts and you do those things that require so much of your time I'll never grow out of it what else am I gonna do no, <laughs> no. I mean my kids my kids are adolescents and um, they need me but they don't need me <laughs> right in yes. a different way and I'm still making all these things and I still love it so much. Yeah. And I enjoy that. So. Oh, yes. Okay. One more thing I wanted to ask you about was on your blog, I saw you had a post about eating fermented foods with every meal. Mm-hmm. And so what are your tips for that? What are some of your main sources of fermented foods that you're able to serve at every meal? Yeah. So for, I think for breakfast, a fermented dairy is really the easiest way, whether Same, that is yes. yogurt, kefir, um, buttermilk, quark. Yeah, <laughs> there's there you go. Quark. Um, so there's so many, or cheeses. If you get a good raw milk cheese, that's a fermented product and it has all the beneficial bacteria and enzymes in it. So that's really easy for breakfast. Right. And as you said, adding just a spoonful of sauerkraut to your lunch or your dinner. I mean, sauerkraut is even great on salads and um, it, it yeah. adds a really good taste to it. But then there's some other foods that people don't usually associate with adding fermented foods. Um, miso maybe, but miso you want to be careful not to uh, heat it up too much because then you kill off all the yeah. good stuff in there. Um, olives and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> here's a way that, that you can then. <laughs> justify eating chocolate yeah chocolate has uh is is a fermented food i would have to go back and look at it i think i have 10 foods on there that are fermented foods but yeah or you can add some fermented um like peppers hot spices or just pickles if they're if they're, if they're life fermented and not pasteurized yeah so just thinking outside the box and um and adding those it's really easy to add some, some ferments to your meals and, and get the good gut bacteria going. It is. And I think people get intimidated by fermented foods, probably because there's so many options on how to do it, but we do even a simple fermented jalapeno. And obviously the kids don't eat it, but Luke and I can put that with anything. And I just put jalapenos in salt water, let it sit out for three or four days. And then that's done. So it's as easy yeah. as chopping up jalapenos and adding it to salt water is all it is and right. then it's there it's so and simple it yeah. is and then you just pull it out with each meal yeah and the sauerkraut too is actually really easy i mean yeah. sometimes i think we overthink things and think they're more complicated than they really are mm-hmm. and i always encourage people especially with sourdough oh and then sourdough oh well, how could i forget sourdough well, right. <laughs> yeah sourdough. <laughs> sourdough is a fermented food there you go yeah, can't forget <laughs> From, that. you know sourdough bread sourdough rolls um yeah so the sauerkraut is so easy. And sometimes when I'm super lazy and I just need to get it going and I know I won't have time to chop it now, I don't have to make sauerkraut for eight people. Um, but, you know, Trader Joe's has a um, coleslaw, if you will. You can just take oh, yeah. that. It's already chopped up. It's, it's already chopped up. Sprinkle some salt on it. I mean, with sauerkraut, it's good to actually get that 2% salinity 
Um, so you, you don't get any mold on it, um, yeah. but it's also not too salty. But I also know that you can go by taste. If it tastes salty without being so like, ugh, salty, like yes. too much, you want to spit it out, then it's probably just about right. I mean, I don't think that 200 years ago they had scales and were weighing it out to 2% salinity. They probably were going not. by some other things. I can definitely no, go by not. taste yeah. now. I mean, I know that before yeah. you let it ferment, it's going to taste pretty darn salty, but not like you said, like you want to spit it out, but right. saltier than you would want if you were just eating salted cabbage. Exactly. Exactly. Like, and then you make it. And I remember my first sauerkraut, I was all enthusiastic about it and gung ho. And I had a really nice antique crock for my grandparents and it got moldy. And the best thing you can do is throw it out and do it again. Don't get discouraged. And if your first sourdough bread doesn't come out right, don't give up, just keep going because right, yeah. you also learn. And if you try to figure out why it didn't work and then go back, and then do it. And now it's so second nature. I don't even have to think about it. And, right. yes. um, but don't give up, just yes. keep with it. If you're intrigued by sauerkraut, if you're intrigued by sourdough experiment and don't let one or two or three, or even four failures stop you from trying again. Yeah. I definitely had so many sourdough bread failures, <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like now I got it, you know, but it, it took so yeah. many failures along the years, but everything's always edible. You can always make it into a French toast casserole or strata, you know. Croutons. Yeah, yeah croutons, exactly. So Or breadcrumbs. <laughs> yeah, Just yeah. Dry it up and make Put it in like a meatloaf yeah. or, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I, and I like that saying, we make mistakes so we learn from them. Yes. And that's a totally different way of framing things and saying, oh, no, it's not like I'm a failure. It's like, oh, okay, so I learned something from it. Yes. I heard somebody once in the blogging world, she called any big blogging mistakes she made, like things she maybe paid for and didn't need. She called that tuition. <laughs> she was like, this is my tuition, <laughs> like my payment for having to learn something like, oh, seriously, you spent way less on that than a college class and probably learned so much more. <laughs> so, right. I and there's a, that. there's a power in making mistakes because it's a really intense learning experience, one you will never forget. Yep. And you might not really and realize you're learning it at that moment. You might think this exact experience didn't teach me anything. But then once you put together like three or four, you're like, oh, you, the puzzle pieces start to fit together. Yeah. And I'm going to do a video about like our five biggest garden mistakes that we, we made. And I just started with the gardening. I mean, I had obviously I had some experience and I had some ideas and some knowledge, but not a whole lot. And every situation is different. Every climate is different. And yeah. um, you know, your, your microclimate in your garden and, and you know, how it fits in your lifestyle. And now I can go back and say, okay, so that I won't do again, or that I would do different, but now I know. And yeah. um, until you get out there and do it and are willing to fail, you just don't know. And um, I'd rather just go out and make mistakes and say, oh, okay, i recovered from that. There's some things that I can't really unravel in our garden that are just mistakes forever, but hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a few of those. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I'll share them sometime. <laughs> yeah. I put them on the YouTube channel to help somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So other people can learn from my mistakes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for having this discussion and sharing a lot of yeah. your wisdom and knowledge. There's so much more over on your blog and YouTube channel that people can check out over at rgabledhome.com and youtube.com slash rgabledhome, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. I can talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> yeah, so, I know. We could. We fun. definitely could. We could. I know. Right? <laughs> we didn't have other things going. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Make sure to go check out Anya's YouTube channel and her blog and hit subscribe over on YouTube and her Instagram for more info like she just shared. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast, and I will see you in the next one.